I am leading the Global Knowledge Management Center of Excellence, which is based in Tel Aviv, but uh, supports all the different member firms around the globe uh, at Deloitte, uh, which means 80% of our work is with the other global uh, clients. And you can see, you can hear today the Philips case study. Uh, it will be, I think, in a couple of hours. That's one of the interesting uh, stories that we had this year. Last year we presented Toyota, I think. So uh, um, that's... Um, Definitely, I, I'm mentioning it because we have a lot of benchmark that will be very happy to share with you and uh, come visit us at the booth. So you heard uh, Scott's uh, distinction earlier between the uh, pure AI and the uh, pragmatic AI. So I'm definitely coming from the pragmatic AI side and I'm going to talk about uh, the real applicable, feasible, practical solutions that we can uh, uh, develop on our KM solutions using AI and machine learning capabilities. And I brought five examples that I'm going to share with you. Um, usually, you know, we always talk about the fact that we shouldn't gravitate just to the technology and that knowledge management it is much more than that. And in every project that we carry out, we also include the governance and the processes and the taxonomies and so on. But today I will focus a little bit about the technological uh, uh, capabilities that AI and machine learning brings to the table because they are very, uh, very nice and can help you leverage your KM solution. Let's start with a question. How many of you are using Netflix? Mm, good for Netflix. Yeah, very nice. So, yeah. So. You all know that uh, the, the top pick for, uh, for you, right? The, this feature in uh, Netflix. And uh, how do they decide what's right for you? What's the top pick for you? How come Rotten was uh, recommended to me? How do they? No, come on. <laughs> Right, so they create clusters of users with similar uh, uh, preferences. Something here for me as well, I'm using uh, Kafka for me, some others for me, Keep, some that I use. Yeah. Right, so they, they, they identify usage patterns. Yeah. Anyone from Netflix here? <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue this theory uh, discussion. Yeah, anyone else? So you, you, they cluster you with other users. They learn the usage, the patterns. If you can click, if you click on one of them, you see that they see they say you have a 98% match. And because I'm interested in a, a uh, apparently provocative uh, <laughs> and investigative uh, content, um, and the question is why. Why can't we have the same experience in our uh, knowledge management solutions in the organizations that we are working in? How come most of the organizations that I visit have a generic look and feel, a generic uh, set of content types, regardless to your position, characteristics, uh, seniority, and so on? Another example is Amazon, recommended for you again, but there is a bias here. What's the bias here? My wife and my kids use the same <laughs> username. So, so you see that the system, the system recommends the one night super villains and some uh, love stories books uh, that my wife uses. So, but <laughs> hey, that, it's my wife. So, uh, so we want to have the same experience also in the, in the workplace. We want to make sure that, and, and by the way, in the workplace, we won't have this bias because I have my username. I'm the only one who uses it. But in every research that we conduct, we see that the users expect to have a fully personalized experience. They say, I want to feel like the system was developed for me and for me only. And they are talking about the user interface. They are talking about the content types. Even inside the content, the way we organize it, and the first recommendation that I can give you, and a very critical one, is you need to create different personas, different types of solutions for different personas, and every KM journey should start by mapping the types of users, the personas, and how are they going to consume content, what's relevant to them. An R&D guy will see different content than a finance guy, than a sales guy, not because they are not allowed to, just because they don't care. They, they want only what's relevant for them. 
Okay, so just to summarize the first point, and that's the um, personalization, we need to make sure that we first customize and personalize the user experience, the UI, the graphics. We need to make sure that we personalize the content based on what we predict will be his needs, and that's the prediction part that we can have using machine learning uh, capabilities. And we need to create a balance between the push and the pull, so we need to allow them to search for the content and then to have features like autocomplete, which is based on their characteristics and traits and roles, and, but also push capabilities like uh, the Amazon example or the uh, Netflix example to promote content based on the machine learning and the pattern uh, uh, that we, we understand and promote relevant content. So that's the first one, that's the personalization. The second one is the conversational interfaces, the chatbots. You saw Pepper yesterday and today. Pepper is a physical robot, but we have also uh, uh, chatbots that we are using. We saw in our latest research, and I'll be happy to share it with you later, that the, especially the Gen Zs and the millennials prefer to have a conversational interface and not the traditional search engines uh, that we are all used to. They want to talk to the system uh, using voice or text, using their natural language. And the fact that we have today the NLP, the natural language processing capabilities, allow us to have, a, a, to have these solutions. I'll show you a real one. This one is called Delaney. It's a chatbot that we've developed uh, for uh, uh, internal use, but we are selling it to our clients also. So let's say that I'm a new employee at Deloitte, um, and my manager tells me we have an opportunity at Philips. We'll use the Philips example. Um, talk to the LCSP. See if he's okay with that. What the heck is LCSP? So, hi, Delaney. I can use voice, but she won't understand my accent. <laughs> That's how it is. Israel is a small country. We don't need to invest a lot in uh, <laughs> only 7 million people we, until we'll train Delaney to. Uh, so um, what is, sorry, what is, uh, let's say, what does LCSP mean? I can do uh, mistakes, uh, grammar mistakes, it uh, understands everything uh, and understand the synonyms and the intent. So the conversational interface, unlike the traditional search engines, let me, oh, let me re restart. Um, so the conversational interface, unlike the traditional search engines, uh, as the intent understanding mechanism. I guess some of you are familiar with it, but the idea is that Delaney, Delaney will understand that I'm looking for an acronym or a person. Again, let's start uh, what does LCSP mean. No one entered manually for Delaney a question and answer uh, like a frequent questions. She will now crawl different <coughs> repositories in Deloitte and she found the definition, LCSP refers to lead client service partner. That's the partner in, in charge of the relationship with the client. So I guess in one of the documents, in one of the repositories, Delaney identified this uh, acronym, so she brought the answer. But I can ask her also, uh, okay, great. Uh, who is the, um, who is the LCSP for Philips, and she flips. And now Delaney, hopefully, will understand that it's not a, a, a what question, it's a who question. I'm looking for a person. She identified a couple of Philips. Let's do the headquarters. And she will tell me that the global LCSP is uh, Vincent Fruger. So I, the, the chatbot identifies a distinct between a question about a term and it will go to a certain repository and search there, uh, to a question about a person, and then she tries to understand. Think of the traditional SharePoint search en engines, right? If you search for LCSP, who is the LCSP, or what is LCSP, LCSP will get the same results, because the keyword LCSP appears in the search. But then a chatbot can identify the intention of the user and give him uh, different answers. So. Uh, I can use it also to ask, uh, uh, did we ever work 
with Philip. So it's, it's really unstructured and natural language and it crawls different uh, use cases. Uh, anyway, yeah, usually it works. So, um, so that's the conversational interface is something that we definitely see more and more today. Clients are talking about the need to uh, enable the users to retrieve it. And since we have the machine learning capabilities and the NLP capabilities, it became uh, easier today to implement it. So the third, the third uh, solution that I wanted to show you is uh, AI-powered typing. We've developed capabilities to auto-complete complete, uh, sentences or complete phrases and not just the keyword. So in the example that I'll show you now, you see that the user is starting to populate some uh, knowledge item, but you see that it automatically uh, promotes a full sentence to him because it learned that uh, similar users from the same persona uh, are using these sentences uh, uh, very often. So it recommends a complete sentence or a terms from the keyword, from the taxonomy, and it really helps him uh, use the wisdom of the crowd or the collective memory. It automatically uh, suggests uh, sentences that we might use in order to uh, um, not to reinvent everything from scratch. In that example, it uh, says develop a, a comprehensive project plan, whatever. So it's something that probably similar types of users repeated again and again, so it recommends it uh, as a solution. I know we are running out of time, so I'll move forward. The auto-tagging, I saw many, uh, many of the vendors today talked about auto-tagging and auto-classification. It's very modest and humble to bring my own quote. But uh, <laughs> the analyst who prepared the deck is no, no longer with Deloitte. But uh, so auto tagging and auto classification, definitely a, a game changer in our uh, in environment. And my recommendation to you is don't ask your users to manually add the keywords and the metadata values and the terms. No one will do it. That's the number one barrier for adoption. And we have today auto-tagging and auto-classification tools that can crawl the text, identify the, the relevant term and the synonym or whatever, and add it. And today, in every solution that we develop, that's a, a, a mandatory requirement to add auto-tagging capabilities. No one will manually add it, so that's critical. And the last one, I know we are running out of time, is the, the, the DAP. Any of you are familiar with digital adoption platforms? Have you heard of WalkMe? Anyone's using WalkMe here? Okay. So some of you are, and it's a new, it's a new car, uh, category, but it's basically AI-based digital adoption tools that learns the usage pattern and promotes content on the screen to users based on the, the machine understanding of where will they be stuck, what will be their uh, issue, what do they need to do next, and there is a rule-based mechanism that the system uh, promotes. Uh, it will tell you most of the users, while using Salesforce on this screen, will, uh, will have uh, some issues or uh, they won't know what to do. Instead of calling the IT help desk and so on, you can just promote for them a shout out saying you need to do this, you need to do that, and it's a very effective way to improve the engagement rates and the adoption rates, the traditional learning training, you know, just bringing them to class to show them how the system works or uh, sending them uh, e-learning uh, materials is, is not so efficient and we prefer the digital adoption platforms that helps you there. So these were five examples. I'll be happy to share some more with you in our booth, the 206 uh, booth, and uh, thank you for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.